This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 606. We welcome Dr. Marilyn Singleton, and we're going to get a medical and legal perspective on COVID-19 and risk mitigation. Actually, Pete's got the title, The COVID-19 Pandemic, A Unique Perspective from the Left Coast, a perspective from a physician with a law degree. Looking forward to a great show. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. They are the reason IAQ Radio continues to be around. And I want to announce our new marquee sponsor, Instascope. Uh, Instascope, the future of IAQ assessment, unlimited sampling with instant results. Learn more at instascope.co. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. The future of IAQ assessment, unlimited sampling with instant results at instascope.co. Association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute at CIRIScience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association at IAQA.org. The Restoration Industry Association at RestorationIndustry.org. The Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. And Healthy Buildings America 2021 at HB2021-America.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report that no one identified 1.4 to 3.0. is the number of new SARS-CoV-2 infections likely to occur when no members of a community are immune and no preventative measures are taken and they're exposed to someone uh, who has the disease. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. Why are elections in the United States always held on Tuesdays? Back to you, Joe. All right. Today's guest is Dr. Marilyn Singleton. She's a board-certified anesthesiologist and the past president of the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. She graduated from Stanford and earned her MD at the UCSF Medical School. While still working in the operating room, she attended the UC Berkeley Law School, focusing on constitutional law and administrative law. She interned at the National Health Law Project and practiced insurance and health law. Welcome to the show, Dr. Singleton. Thank you for having me. This ought to be great. I'm looking forward to it. It should be an interesting interview. You've got a fascinating background. Um, we, we put the whole background up on our show announcement for folks to take a look at. Um, you came to our attention through an article on masks that Pete picked up that led us to learn more about you. Um, you first trained and worked as a physician. Uh, what led to your interest in pursuing that law degree? Well, when I was growing up, I wanted to be either a doctor or a lawyer. And when I was in college, I just kind of thought medicine would be far more interesting. And it was, still is. And um, I was very glad I went to law school when I was older. It, because a lot of it is common sense and simple logic. So as an older person, some of that you just already have. I mean, you have to read the cases and whatnot, but I, I think uh, age helps. <laughs> Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for, the, for joining us, doctor. Um, 
Let's get right into the interview. Uh, is the general population over fearful about the health risks of COVID-19? Absolutely. I think it's, it's kind of sad, really, that it became a political thing rather than a medical thing. And looking at certain news stations, because they all didn't do this, having this column of COVID deaths, COVID so-called cases, did nobody any good. That one, it was very different across the country. And two, the statistics are very deceiving. One, epidemiologists consider a case, someone who is ill with the illness. It's a, a person who has symptoms. An infection, on the other hand, is someone who tests positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID. They do not make that distinction when they flash those numbers up on TV. 40% of people who test positive are asymptomatic. So there's not as many sick people as those numbers look. Then they show the deaths. And the deaths are somewhat inflated because those are all the people who died with a positive COVID test. It doesn't necessarily mean they died because of COVID. And they never put the recoveries up. So there's no context to it. You just see massive number of so-called cases that aren't cases. They're infections included with people who are sick and never let people know the recovery when overall 99.997% of people recover after they're infected with COVID. I'm curious, with, with respect to the flu, do they treat the deaths the same way? I mean, if you, you died with the flu, even though maybe there was some other, you know, condition that ultimately caused your death, but the flu was a mitigating factor, do they treat flu deaths the same way, or is there some difference there? No, and it's kind of interesting, because when you go to the CDC website, number one, what they call the flu, they're called ILIs, influenza-like illness, because everybody doesn't get a flu test. So a lot of these diagnoses are clinical. But let's say somebody has congestive heart failure and they're at sort of the end stage and they get the flu. The flu might tip them over and maybe they had a month to live anyway. So maybe they died in two weeks. So you're kind of on the edge there. Did the flu kill them? Well, not really. They had terminal congestive heart failure. So there's a, a lot of people who fall in that category. And we certainly see that with COVID because the number one risk factor is age. And guess what number two is? And, and, and this is so politically incorrect. It's obesity, obesity, obesity. And interestingly, one of the things that's coming out and people are now saying is bad cases of COVID seem to be a disease of the well-off, a disease of countries who are doing well, well-fed people. And very few people in Africa have it. And at first they said, well, the reporting just isn't that good. And maybe it's because they're on hydroxychloroquine for malaria. But generally, maybe for about seven years, they stopped that prophylaxis because the um, falciparum uh, parasite had adapted to it. So the people weren't really taking anything. But the one thing they are is thin. And so they started looking around and certainly in America, it's age, obesity, then hypertension and diabetes. And the obesity and diabetes kind of go hand in hand. And so now they're examining down that, that avenue that there's something about the glycoprotein coat in fat that attracts that um, SARS virus. 
So there's still a lot of unknowns out there, but the numbers are clear as far as what the risk factors are. And um, so people who don't have these risk factors, yes, they might become infected, but they are highly, highly unlikely to get terribly sick and die. And now there's always somebody says, yes, but that young athlete got it. Well, there's always people out there on the margins. There's, you know, young, healthy people, so-called young, healthy people that drop dead for no apparent reason. Generally, there is a reason, but we never hear about it. We just hear the flashing headline and we never hear the follow-up. And of course, because of HIPAA and privacy laws, you won't actually know what's wrong with the person. I, I remember there was a person in the area when they said, first team dies of COVID. Well, he didn't die of COVID. It was likely a drug overdose. So, you know, it's, it's, it's this sort of um, sensationalism that certainly as doctors, we find very bothersome because what happens when you start to exaggerate, then people don't believe anything you say. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Now, I, I, I assume you're, you're not saying this is nothing at all. That no, still be absolutely covered. not. Uh, it's what, a nasty, nasty virus. Okay. And what are the precautions that you feel people should take in their own daily life to try and avoid, you know, getting this, this nasty, nasty virus? Well, certainly the first thing, and, and this is something that, um, if you say something good that's come out of it, is wash your hands. People who wash their hands tend not to get colds during the year. And, you know, people wonder why kids get so many colds. One, they don't have a lot of baseline uh, immunity to colds because they're young and they haven't gotten any, but they never wash their hands. And the people who wash their hands tend not to get colds. And we have to remember the coronavirus is one of seven coronaviruses, four of which cause the common cold. I mean, so people know about coronaviruses in general. This one just happens to be one that the receptors that it gloms onto um, makes people sicker than the common cold, but people know about the virus. So A number one, is wash your hands and use good cough and sneezing hygiene. The old cough into your elbow. And you know, because people used to do like this and it's like, no, then you have the germs all over your hands, don't go wash your hands and then it spreads over everything. Early on, there was a lot of talk about all the surfaces that were, um, had fomites of uh, the SARS virus on it. Over time, people have now decided that a lot of those, you measure it, but it's not active infectious virus. But nonetheless, one should still clean the surfaces. But remembering that the SARS virus is floating in the air, so it's always gonna drop on things. Very, very important is to try to stay as well ventilated as possible. Studies have shown that even just cracking a door or a window can rapid, rapidly decrease the number of measurable SARS virus in the room within 30 seconds. So, and in fact, when someone gets sick, one of the first things you do is give them fresh air. Um, and then, of course, if you're at home with someone who's ill, that you should isolate them if you have to be in the same house. If you have an extra bath bathroom, let the person who's sick use one bathroom and have, if it's a household of people, at least have only one person who does all the daily care, let them have their own towels and whatnot where you do try to keep that person isolated. If you're at home, you're the one that's sick, isolate yourself. I, what about um, social distancing, use of masks? Um, any, any comments on those? 
Well, certainly outside, it's kind of interesting. The whole social distancing thing was um, kind of made up in the beginning and uh, it, it didn't have a real basis. And more and more they started doing studies of coughs and how far they traveled. And, and what's fascinating to me, now that they have found these virions in the air, not just in a droplet of mucus, that those travel 27 feet. So then the question is, okay, we have the magic number of six feet and that's for the droplets. But as far as what's floating around in the air, we certainly can't social distance 27 feet, but six feet is something doable. And certainly it makes sense to avoid others, especially strangers. You don't know anything about them. You don't know if they know good coughing etiquette. Um, masks are up in the air now. The, everybody's saying to wear masks now, but before COVID, when you look at all the studies, all the studies showed that other than the N95, they didn't work. So interestingly, there's studies that are cropping up that um, are saying that yes, a cloth mask, and I say cloth mask because most people are not wearing properly fitted N95 masks. Those right. are the healthcare workers who are protecting themselves. They're not protecting the patients. They're protecting themselves from the patient. Um, cloth masks are what the random population is wearing. So that's why there's a lot of focus on that. And certainly, um, the first random, uh, randomized clinical trial was in Australia in 2015, and they showed no benefit of cloth masks whatsoever. And it was hard to do a control in that study because the Institutional uh, Review Board said that it would be unethical to try to have a group of people to not wear a mask at all in the hospital. So some of the control group had masks, some didn't, but the cloth masks perform worse than the control group, which may or may not have had some sort of mask on. So it's, it's up in the air in that regard. One of the things about masks is it makes people feel like there's something they can do. There's something active they can do. If it doesn't do physical harm, which some people try to argue it might lower the oxygen or increase the CO2, but when actual end tidal CO2 is measured, it seems to be normal. And in a handful of people, it appears that the oxygen saturation drops somewhat, but it doesn't drop to hypoxic levels, maybe from um, SAO2 of 100 down to 98, but you're still high up on that oxygen saturation curve. So those are plus minus. However, something that is real is bacterial contamination of a cloth mask. And this, this is where you start to, to get into human behavior and get into American behavior versus trying to compare us to people in Singapore where people obey in Singapore. Uh, we don't obey here in America. And um, even in Singapore, and I found this a fascinating study, they had people wear masks, they followed them, and only 12% of people wore the mask properly, wore it when they were supposed to wear it. So it, it's just kind of interesting because adherence to a protocol is what makes something work. So if people aren't going to adhere, then it, it's like if you look at people wandering down the street, they might have a mask on, but their nose is out. 
because they might be finding it hard to breathe or whatever. Well, there's more of the virus in your nose. So, um, it, you know, it, it's one of these things. So they say, oh, well, I'm wearing a mask, but then their nose is hanging out. And then if you really want to protect yourself, you should always wear glasses of some sort because the virus can come in in your eyes, float down in the tear ducts and get in your nose and then down in your lungs. So we have to use some common sense and please, if you're sick, stay home and don't put yourself in a setting where you could get sick if you're vulnerable. And, and remembering that when people get sick from a virus, there's the susceptibility of the host matters, the type of agent matters, and all these are influenced by temperature and humidity, which is another thing that's kind of interesting when people are trying to gather data from around the world and people are looking at Australia about this, that, or the other, Australia has opposite seasons than where we are. Their summer is our winter and vice versa. So can we really compare that? Because we know humidity is something that is good for us, bad for the virus, and dry air is good for the virus. So there's so many factors that come in and everybody's eager to find a single answer. And people want the mask to be a magic bullet. And we can't think that way because people get a false sense of security. They think, oh, wow, this works. When in fact, it really doesn't. And most of these studies that they've done recently have been laboratory studies. They haven't been studies out in the community. Now, interestingly, there's a study that the authors swear is being censored. It came out of um, Denmark, 3,000 participants. It was a community study on masks because that's the one thing that hasn't been done. They've done it on healthcare workers, trying to see if healthcare workers had less incidence of flu, et cetera, but nothing in the community. This was a community study. We saw what the study, how the makeup of the study, and that's listed in, in the list of clinical trials that are out there. It was finished in June and they've been shopping it around to get published. And people are wondering, okay, is the answer not what people wanted to hear? That why haven't the real numbers come out? So this is the big medical mystery now. What happened to the Danish study? And uh, because that's what we need to know, how well it works in the community, not healthcare workers in the hospital. We can follow up on that. Cliff, go ahead. You want to give a yeah, one jump thanks, in? Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I want to just change subjects a little bit because uh, you're a physician. Um, do you think we should be focusing more on prevention? You know, I've heard different medical doctors touting supplements, you know, for improving our immune systems, such as you know, vitamin D3 and chelated zinc and vitamin C and beta glucan and elderberry. Uh, why are these treatments just being summarily dismissed? Do you believe that they you know, could have a positive effect? Oh, absolutely they can have a positive effect. And, and it's certainly known. There seems to be kind of a, a prejudice, I guess, against so-called natural things. But natural things are real. I mean, scurvy is caused by a lack of vitamin C and you could go down the list. And I think back to several years ago when the ophthalmologist came up with this vitamin regimen for a certain type of macular degeneration and people thought, oh, 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 these are mere vitamins and it works. And so now it's a standard therapy for a certain type of, of, of that problem. So we can't poo-poo things. And we've gotten so trained 
into expensive pharmaceuticals when sometimes basic things will work. And certainly for COVID, very important. And now there's studies, so this isn't just speculation, that people had noticed in the 1918 flu epidemic that people who went outside did better than people who did not. And, you know, there was, a, oh, they got fresh air. Well, it was the sunlight. It was the vitamin D. So taking that concept further, they've actually studied people who have done poorly with COVID and they have low vitamin D levels. So there's actually been a comparison where somebody has measured vitamin D levels. So 54%, your chance of, of getting COVID, it's decreased by 54% if you have a normal vitamin D. Now, I don't want people to run out and start taking handfuls of this stuff, but because it is, you, if you take too much, it can be toxic. So it is a level that's worth getting measured by the doctor. So just be careful in that regard. Um, there's herbs that improve interferons. Now interferons are proteins that are released by host cells that boost the immune system. So there's, you know, chlorophyll, CoQ10, melatonin, vitamin C, the various flavonoids that, that come in um, uh, onions and garlic and, and um, astragalus. These things do boost interferons. So I look at it like, why not? And that one of the things COVID has brought out, which many of us have tried to tell people, you have to take care of yourself. You, you know, you kind of look at, you know, people talk about health care. Well, we in medicine talk about medical care is one thing and health care is another. Medical care is what we went to medical school to learn how to help you. And health care is something you have to help do for yourself. And and again, this circles around to obesity, that it's kind of like cut back on the food. Yes, there's some diseases where you can help it um, if you're obese, and, but, and, and some people have something full metabolic syndrome. But for the most part, most of us have the extra weight on because we eat too many desserts and whatnot and eat too many sweets. So we have to look at what we're doing in our own lives, but there's no question, there's a bias. And I saw something flash up on the chat. I, I can't have the whole chat up. You know, there's no money in these things. And I hate to say it, it sounds jaded, but people want prescription pharmaceuticals. In fact, they've even done studies on telling somebody it's a prescription versus it's not a prescription. And they believe it more if they think it's a prescription. They believe it more <laughs> if it costs more. I, you know, it, it's, it's psychological warfare, it seems, against us taking care of ourselves. Let me, uh, we're almost at halftime, but before we go there, I don't know if you can answer this in two or three minutes, but uh, there's a question on the chat about long haulers. And I think that's an interesting question that some people seem to have issues from this virus for much longer than others. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Just basically it depends on, and as far as I know, and there could be more, you know, I haven't read absolutely everything on this that how many of these so-called, they call ACE2 receptors, that's what the SARS virus binds to. How many different uh, places in the body it glommed onto these ACE2 receptors. And we've got tons of them. And it's one of the reasons they think kids do so well because they don't have very many. And the older you are, the more you have. So, um, uh, it, People haven't quite figured out the mechanism, but a lot of people are pointing to the ACE2 receptors and whether there's a lot of virus that's still kind of stuck 
hanging in there. It might have stopped replicating, but it's still acting as a parasite on the host cell. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, we have asymptomatic people who have, they've had the virus. They don't seem to be affected by it. What are the chances, if any, that down the road, they may have some kind of issue? I mean, there are viruses that cause cancer, as I understand it, uh, many years later. Is there any chance with this virus we'll see the same kind of thing? We don't know. I mean, look at chicken pox. That chicken pox, you can have a subclinical case, and then later down the way, when you get older, you get shingles. And the chicken pox virus sort of hides in the ganglion cells. So the virus can hide somewhere, no question about it. We don't know. It hasn't been around long enough. Now, SARS-1, which was the epidemic in 2003, this similar but not exactly the same virus, a coronavirus, SARS-1, um, hasn't seemed to have come back. There's sporadic cases, and they don't seem to have folks who have then popped up with it. So we're talking 15, 16 years after that one broke out. And that one broke out, and then it just fizzled out. It burned out. Nothing was done. They stopped working on a vaccine because it just fizzled out. Interesting. Hey, we've got to stop here and thank our sponsors. Uh, we'll be back with the second half of our interview. We've got Dr. Marilyn Singleton. Great, great, uh, great interview on the SARS-CoV-2 issue. We'll be back in two minutes. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. Do more jobs faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Healthy workplaces, a healthier world at AIHA.org. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Advancing careers of professionals in environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety. Interested in defining their science at ACGIH.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at SiriScience.org. That's C-I-R-I Science.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, promoting the exchange of indoor environmental quality information through education and research at IAQA.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders at restorationindustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC at IICRC.org, Healthy Buildings America 2021, Honolulu, Hawaii, August 10 through 12, 2021. Learn more at hb2021-america.org. Our industry sponsors, AEML Laboratories, Free shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and no rush fee. Learn more at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus, particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us at particlesplus.com. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry pros and consumers at healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back. We've got the second half of our interview with Dr. Singleton. Cliff, why don't you go ahead and ask the first question? Thanks, Joe. Uh, you know, in my opinion, following the science means that we may get the answers eventually after science does studies, which can take up time and cost a lot of money. I understand that vaccine studies are very complex, even when they're fast tracked. Can you give IQ Radio listeners your viewpoint on pros and cons of vaccines and therapeutics. Okay, that's a big one. Let me just go through a bit on vaccines. Just the heretofore, the fastest vaccine that had come up was the mumps vaccine, and that took five years. What you generally do with vaccines, they have phase one, 
where you give the drug to a small number of healthy people and um, people who have the disease, you look for side effects. Okay, if there's no gross side effects and usually it's injection side or something like that, then you move on to phase two. You give the drug to several hundred people, still looking for side effects, no side effects. Then phase three is large scale and that's 3,000 people plus a placebo group. And this usually takes one to four years. And this is something we don't know about this current vaccine is what the placebo is. Because the placebo should not just be saline, that it has to be whatever carrier that they're using for the vaccine. So, and we don't know what the placebo would be. And then finally, phase four, the drugs approved. One of the things when they did this warp speed, and that's part of why it was faster, is that generally the company is not going to make the vials and, and the single jet injectors and all that sort of thing until they know the vaccine is approved. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of manufacturing, et cetera. So they don't do all the other stuff. What has happened with this is everything has been done simultaneously. So the drug companies, of course, were paid the losses that, of course, they would have um, if something didn't work. So that's kind of how all that vaccine stuff works. There's problems, of course. They've surveyed people now and asked people would they take it. And um, only 10% said they'd take it right off the bat. And then that number kind of creeps up um, to a little over 60% with definitive proof that it works. Okay, so that's just people wanting to take it. Then you have, does the immunity last? Now, usually immunity from getting a disease itself lasts longer than the immunity you get from a vaccination. And uh, SARS-1 and MERS, the immunity seemed to last about three years. And uh, there's something called T-cell immunity that's generalized immunity, um, where it's not a specific antibody to a specific disease, but just your general immunity, that um, that may last and last a long time. And in fact, they found people who never knew they had COVID had T cell immunity to COVID when they got a test done because they were going to get blood. So then of course it might not work. And the SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. MERS, SARS, colds, Ebola, what else? Rabies, polio. They're RNA viruses. And that's where the RNA is the genetic material. They replicate faster than DNA viruses. And AIDS is a perfect example. They were looking for a vaccine for AIDS for years. They've yet to have a vaccine for AIDS. And AIDS is one of those things that we can, it's still considered a pandemic, but it's a controlled pandemic. And that could be what happens with coronavirus. Anyway, then you start to look at the numbers and the flu vaccine is being generous to say it's 50% effective. So let's assume the vaccine is 50% effective, even though the Pfizer one that was just introduced said it was 90% effective, but then you have half the people take it, you still end up with a pretty low immunization rate. And for community immunity, some say you need 40 to 70 percent of people who would be immune. Now, a lot of people say because there's such a big T cell immunity to this disease that maybe you only need 40 percent of people immune. And then, of course, what happens with mutations? So far, there's a lot of mutations, but none of them seem to be on the part of the, the virus that's going to make a difference. Now, interestingly, there was a guy named William Farr way back in the 1850s with the smallpox, and 
he made a far curve and it shows kind of what goes up must go down and it's a curve of an epidemic and that it they appear to go down at the same rate that they came up so you know we we don't know we kind of still a lot of people think there hasn't been a first wave second wave third wave because coronavirus has never really gone away so we're kind of in a first wave that has a few extra peaks so um uh if enough people take the vaccine if in fact it really works that would be great but then you start to get into this whole question of are you going to force people to take it um and that's a big question and it's a question that's happening around the world and and people are already rebelling against the idea that you would force someone to take it and uh so this is something we have to look at. So it's not just good enough to have a vaccine, the practicality of what individual people will do is a whole nother story. Well, and then you have the, the practicality of distributing it, uh, especially if it has to be stored at negative 70 degrees. And uh, this is, and then the other thing I, I heard recently, and I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, the Pfizer vaccination, they're saying now that people who get that vaccination are going to feel like some of them anyway, a pretty significant number of them are going to feel like they have the flu for a couple of days. And, and will they go back for the second shot if after the first one, they felt like crap for a couple of days and had to miss work and so on and so forth. I think we've got a long way to go on this. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Because some of these other viruses take two shots. So, um, there is a ways to go. And that's one of the reasons why there's a whole group of physicians from around the world who are really pushing the idea and publishing the idea that we must have early treatment. One of the biggest things that happened with this COVID is early on people said, oh, well, just stay home and drink fluids and don't do anything. And some people were lucky, the virus stopped replicating and they, they didn't get sick. You know, they have that, that phase, the initial phase, the viral replication, the second phase is the overreactive inflammatory response. And then the last phase where people end up in the ICU is where they get all these thrombi the, the, that embolize all over the body. And there's this push that, Phase one, the viral replication needs treatment. And this is where the antibiotics, the antiparasitics, the vitamin D and zinc, the zinc is so important. And uh, these antiparasitics, the reason they seem to work is they drive the zinc into the cell. And it's the zinc that stops the viral replication because that's the key. One virus, Virion, can make you sick, but generally, and they have all these mathematical formulas for the likelihood of how many billions you'd need to actually truly get sick. But again, that's where it comes in. It depends on the host and their susceptibility, whether one's going to make you sick or you're going to need a big dose. And um, again, we're the mask thing comes in, if it helps decrease the dose of virus that you get, then that would be a good thing that maybe you'll get a milder disease. But so early treatment is stressed. And so many of these studies like on ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were done when it was given late. It was like given in the wrong stage that if you give it early on, that's where it's helpful, stopping that replication. And if the virus can't overwhelm your system, then you likely won't get the cytokine storm and um, the thrombotic events. So this is, there's protocols that uh, cardiologists from Baylor has come up with, just excellent algorithms of what to do. But the whole point is day one, you need to start doing something and not just as 
was recommended early on, wait till you get sick to call anybody or go in and see a doctor. Let's, um, I'd like to jump to the legal side. Cliff, do you want to jump in here or do you want me to, I got a text question from a listener. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead and ask that. All right. on, the, on that legal side, workers' comp insurers and government agencies like the Department of Labor, uh, what are they saying about the risk of worker and liability of business enterprises? So I've got a small construction company. I worry about one of the guys getting sick and then, in, you know, maybe infecting a customer. Can you give some general legal uh, thoughts on, on how this is being handled? Well, Number one, you just have to say, certainly for employers, they have to follow the law and the recommendations, no matter what the employee might want or want to do. Um, it's, it was interesting that one place that I worked, people didn't want their lunch break, that they wanted to go home a little earlier and forego the lunch break which nobody really cared about, but the Department of Labor cared about it because they said nobody is supposed to work more than five hours without having a break, even though that the employee wanted to violate that rule. And I'm sure the same thing's happening with COVID and it's a tough spot for employers to be in. The employee wants to work. And if your state or city, county has put out some rule, you just better follow the rule because sadly, you'd get in trouble. Even if that employee had gone out to the bars that night and caught COVID at the bars, that um, you can never prove where they caught it. And if they say, well, you were at work and you didn't have this type of PPE or you didn't make this precaution, you're on the hook. And I know in California, the labor board pays for the employee to have their grievance, but they don't pay for you. So you'd be on the hook for all your legal fees. Yeah, it's a tough situation for employers. And it's funny you, you mentioned lunches because I go through that with my guys all the time. They want to take on no lunch. We'll just leave a half hour early. I'm like, ah, you're killing me guys. <laughs> you know? and now exactly. I've got a nephew that, you know, he's a union uh, sheet metal worker and his mother got a false positive test for COVID. And because he told them, look, I was, I stay with my mother. Sometimes I was around someone with COVID. He has to take two weeks off now, even though it came back as a false positive. So it's a tough situation for people right now uh, with the legal and insurance and, and medical issues. And we appreciate having you on. Let, why don't we do this? Let's go to our roundup. We'll bring in the restoration industry global watchdog and uh, wrap things up. Let's bring Pete in here, Restoration Industry Global Watchdog. Pete, I'm sure you have some thoughts or a question for Dr. Yeah, Singh. hey. So listen, just a couple of quick things. I, I said, I'm, I'm going to pull a Dieter on you now here, Joe, because remember when Dieter used to come out of you or whatever? You know, I wrote down a few things I'm going to ask the doctor, and I like to close with that. But just listening to the conversation brings more stuff up. The one thing I want to say on the on that that last employment question that you're all dealing with, you know, I, I was a contractor in California for 20 years. One of the things that employees want to do, and this is a state-by-state -state thing, and I'm not certainly giving legal advice, but not only do you have to take the break, like Joe, like you were talking about, and like the, Dr. Singleton said, but do you know that in some states, and I don't know if this is still the case in California, employees are not allowed to take their, their break at their desk. Hmm. They, they got to go somewhere else because that's an overlap. Are they working? and not really taking a break. So just an FYI for that. I think that's a state thing, certainly not a federal thing. The other thing that I thought was interesting very early on when you were talking about the naturalist stuff. Um, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, just in a history class, they used to talk, they, when they talked about scurvy that the doctor brought up and all those sailors on some British ship that all, they, 
they got the scurvy. And, you know, the whole deal was, you know, eat oranges and do a lot of vitamin C. And, and, and as kids, at least of my generation, we always were to have more vitamin C during the flu season because supposedly it helped. And uh, so, I mean, whether it's true or not, whether it's an old wives' tale, who actually really knows, you know, and then echinacea came and a lot of other things and natural stuff that people take to kind of try to fight that. Um, the other thing was she mentioned, you mentioned and talked about the thing with the garlic and onions and that whole category of, uh, I can't remember the technical name you used, but leeks and scallions, all that comes in there. There was a study that I recall, and I'm not going to give medical advice, but apparently from 1970 to about 2000, there was a 30-year study that the Chinese did. And uh, they had two groups of people, of men, one of them that had a very high in their diet of garlic and all that kind of stuff, and the other that didn't. And supposedly what this study said, and maybe, doctor, you know the study or not, but I can recall it, because I'm an Italian and we eat a lot of garlic. And uh, basically the study said that the men that had the high amounts of eating garlic and onions in their diet essentially had a much lower percent of uh, prostate cancer. So I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know. Um, but I, it's interesting that in the recent years, people take garlic pills versus just eating garlic. They take fish oil pills versus eating six, six ounces of salmon. So I don't know. Just uh, Well, just, it, the, the Mediterranean diet is considered the best diet in the world, the best diet for you, the best cardiac diet. So that's what's in it. Olive oil, fish, um, minimal red meat, lots of vegetables. Yeah. Onions, and, that, and that's the garlic. way the, that's the way the Italians eat, the French eat. And actually they had it, they, there was another study of Spain. Franco, you know, was was their guy there for many, many years when we were young. And then after the Franco regime, at that particular time, in Spain, in Europe, they had the highest degrees of high cholesterol, all that kind of stuff. And then they moved to this Mediterranean diet, similar to the French and the Italians. And now I think supposedly Spain is, is probably in one of the lowest things. So I, I guess maybe there's something to be said for that. Not the fact that certain people maybe are predisposed and that, that's another whole discussion. But um, in any case, uh, I... Anyway, I thought it was kind of an interesting discussion. So look, let me get to the heart of a couple of questions that I had prepared for you, Dr. Singleton. I think the first thing I wanted to do was kind of comment and set the table for you and tell our audience a little bit of how we kind of came about, um, you know, bringing you to the show. I, first of all, I appreciate you coming on. And I also think that, uh, um, you know, it was a very interesting interview and uh, the questions with, uh, from Cliff and uh, um and Joe, and, and hopefully, you know, our, our listeners will find some pretty good value in that. But I remember I, I saw the your association that you belong to or you're part of is this uh, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. And one of the uh, uh, an insurance adjusters, it's well known in our industry, had posted a, uh, a, uh, a um, I, I guess it's a, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but you were the curator of it. And I didn't really know what the curating meant. Mm -hmm until you told me that it was you assembled information, you didn't actually write the information, and then some conclusions were drawn. And uh, I thought it was interesting, it was on mask and the use of mask that, that the uh, person that put it out was an insurance adjuster because, you know, those, the use of different PPEs affects the scope of work on projects and how much money insurance companies would pay. And there's always something that our industry is very concerned about. A lot of our listeners even calling an hour from industrial hygiene, and that, that's a big part of their business things that they do and, and part of their skill set. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then when we talked, you know, we had a connection through, I lived in the Bay Area for years, and that's where you were from, and a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, history when I looked at your website. But then you told me that Britt Hume was the one that posted uh, that. So my question, my first question would be, what led your association to actually publish that information? And what's the backstory of why such a well-known broadcaster like Britt Kume actually uh, posted it to social media and then it took a, took a mind of its own after that. Well, I think part of it is AAPS does like to look at issues that have some controversy in medicine um, without getting to, into all the recent censorship. 
that uh, that's one of the things we try to overcome and discuss things that people are kind of afraid to talk about. And what made us want to really look into mass is the fact that when COVID first started, we were told, eh, who needs to wear a mask? And that the only people who need to wear a mask are the healthcare workers. And then at some point through no good reason and no data, even looking on the CDC website, they have no data that says masks work. Magically, we were told to wear masks. And this led us to believe that some of it was a psychological tool more than a medical tool, just to make people feel like they could do something and that they weren't just sitting around waiting to get sick. So um, I probably ended up looking at, oh, probably 300 studies and tried to see as many meta-analyses as I could find. And the thing that was fascinating, there was not a single study, even in the CDC's own website, that did a meta-analysis of influenza prevention from 1945 to 2016 and found that masks were of no use in decreasing folks, again, healthcare workers, from getting influenza. So it, it, it makes you start to wonder. And they've now, one, one of the things that they have are these laboratory studies where people will sit there and a machine will blow air on them and then they measure the pressure drop and all that. But is that real world? So we, we come back to, we need real world answers not laboratory answers. And that's why everyone's waiting for this, this uh, Danish study. Yeah, so uh, how did it come about that Britt actually was the one who posted it? I have no idea <laughs> that, you know, it got tweeted by somebody <laughs> and, and he picked it up, you know, Twitter, you, you never know who's yeah. gonna pick it up. Well, he said, Britt's kind of an old school guy and cutting the mold of, of uh, you know, Walter Cronkite. My final thing was, doctor, I know when we were talking, your husband background is in property facility management. He used to work at Johnson Controls and for a long time he's had uh, his own uh, facility management company. I thought that was interesting because I think there's a connection between the listeners and the industry of our show. And of course, all of the, uh, um, you know, facility manager obviously are concerned when they have any kind of uh, the water intrusion or smoke or fire or any kind of an incident in their building. So um, uh, is there a possibility that uh, we may be able to do some uh, cross sharing of, of the show with a link in the facility management industry through your husband's contacts well, and get a little cross pollinization? Oh, well, now he, he didn't do facility management as such. He was a air controls engineer and what he did when he left Johnson Controls was start his own company, AirTech Sales, where he sold um, various air conditioning things, you know, duck socks and, and all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, he was, and he, he retired along when I did and he sold his company to one of the workers at his company. So. All right. Well, listen, if you still have some connections through that whole facility management, we can get a little bit of cross-pollinization. There's nothing wrong with that. And on that note, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to you, Joe. All right. Thanks, Pete. Dr. Gandhi from UCSF and this whole thing with masks, the biggest thing I think that we can hang our hat on, her research, uh, interestingly, one... <laughs> study that she had just done that had to be withdrawn because they said wearing masks in 1,063 counties across the United States decreased infection. Well, it turned out all those counties had increased infection, so they had to withdraw the study. But her concept, and she, this is what she's been really putting out, of decreasing the inoculum, whether 
you know, stuff gets through the mask or not, we know some gets through that um, wearing the mask might decrease the inoculum of the amount of virus. And that if you do wear a cloth mask, you've got to take it off and wash it, that you don't want bacteria growing in it. I, I think that's a great way to, to end Dr. Singleton, because I don't, you know, I, I understand people are concerned about people not wearing masks properly, not maintaining them properly, and not even having the right one in the first place. Um, and I don't think you're saying that we shouldn't try um, and that there is no benefit whatsoever, We either as a source control or as some kind of uh, personal protective equipment, even if it's only 10 or 20 percent effective, if you have the right number of layers and you wear it properly and you maintain it properly, I think we would both agree that that information needs to get out to people, that they need to learn. If they're going to use a mask, use the right one, use it properly, maintain it properly, and then we'll see what happens as far as the uh, effects of that go. Well, and, and that's absolutely correct. Get the right thing. And there are ways of rubbing it to increase aesthetic electricity, to trap more vi virus, all these things. But education is the key. And that's where the sensationalism doesn't do any of us any good. We need proper education. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. We, oh, before we go, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, just, just what I just said. We need to educate people. Perfect. And, uh, and I hope that we've managed to do this and everybody who listened will tell everybody else, you, you can't believe everything you see on the TV. And definitely remember the difference between a case and someone who just tests positive. They're two different things and don't conflate the two, like they do on the news. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us. We appreciate having you, Dr. Marilyn Singleton. Uh, excellent interview. We appreciate it. And I hope we, hopefully we'll hear back from you again in the not too distant future. I will send you a copy of the uh, chat log so that you have all the references on there. And um, from there, we're going to just talk about next week. Uh, our thanks to this week's guest, Dr. Marilyn Singleton, to the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick, John, you got to have faith at the controls, Pete, the Restoration Industry Global Watchdog, uh, and of course, our growing group of loyal listeners. We're going to do a little hurricane show next week, kind of a round table. Uh, Florida got hit just recently again, and we've had a lot of uh, hurricane and rain-related issues, so we're going to follow up on that next week on the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.